Awesome. You're already filling in the answers. <laughs> well, I thought we were supposed to. It's a pre oh, no, it's not a pretest. Sorry. I'll tell you the answers. Oh, okay. Although, you, if you can get them all, maybe you could just teach the workshop. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll get I know what he's like. My friend. That might work pay. out. <laughs> What's that? What's the pay? Oh, yeah. oh, it's Saturday. What about the form you want to fill out? Did you have one? What are the yeah, benefits? Yeah. Awesome. I'll collect those too. Yeah. What are the benefits? <laughs> it's a government job, so. Not many. Does anyone else have a form like this? I'm not sure how many of those stuff you mailed out this time around. All right. We're good. Okay. Well, we're going to get started here. Um, I know a handful of you already. My name is Luke Gordon. I'm a physical therapist. Uh, my dad and I are owners here of Gordon Physical Therapy. And today, of course, we're talking about successful recovery from total knee replacement, which is, which is a big topic because so many people are having knee replacements these days. And the reason we created the workshop is that we tend to just see people after surgery. So they've gone and had their surgery. A lot of them will do some type of a rehab, maybe home health for a while. And then when they come to us, you know, we, we do what we do an outpatient to help them regain their strength and mobility and all that. Um, but so often there's just, there's a lot of people that could have done to improve their experience with us here and potentially spend less time here and just get back to the things that they really like to do quicker. So not that we don't like spending time with our patients, but we also know that um, people have other things they would rather be doing than physical therapy. So no hard feelings, right? <laughs> we talk about this a lot in our staff meetings is that we're, we're kind of a grudge, a grudge purchase, we call it. But people, people like to be here because we're friendly and we're outgoing, but they really don't want to be here. So if we can help you save time and you know, shave a few visits off your recovery, that's something that's worth talking about. So that's why we're here today. Um, as you can see on the clipboards, everyone get a clipboard that wanted one. You can take notes on there. I'm going to tell you the answers, Kirsten. So if you've already started filling it out, you're going to see how you you're going to see how you did. But we're going to go down through there and just cover a lot of information. One of the things I want to do too is to kind of set the tone <clears throat> is that I want this to be as interactive as possible for everyone here. So if you have specific questions, shout them out as I'm going along. We're going to, you know, look at some more detailed stuff towards the end in terms of specific stretches, specific exercises. So I really want to just give you guys as much usable information as, as I can. That way, you know, you have a good base to, to come away feeling like you're in a good position. So, sound good? Yes. Everyone in for that? Cool, 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 cool. Okay, um, before we get started here too, actually, I know not everyone in here is having a total knee replacement, but real quick, show of hands, um, how many folks here are already scheduled or planning to have a total knee replacement? Maybe. Maybe. You're, so you're on the fence. Is anyone else still kind of on the fence like Kirsten? A little bit. Are you yeah, already I, need, scheduled? I need to do it though. I know okay. That, yeah. I'm Is hoping it? to avoid it by learning all I can, building some strength and good. Knees and flexibility. So. Good, good, good. I hope to just push it out. To the yeah, future. and exactly. And, you know, by the time you've had the doctor tell you something like, well, your knee is going to need to be replaced at some point. You know, then you just kind of switch gears and say, well, how long can I prolong this? And, and, you know, will I actually need a total knee? So that's good. Anyone else here kind of on the fence about it? Not quite sure. Is there a downside to prolonging the, you know, postponing yes. the surgery? Potentially, yes. And what was that? She said, is there a downside to prolonging the surgery? The only downside I would say is if you prolong it to the point where you're very, very inactive uh -huh. and you're not moving around much and you're not enjoying the things you want to enjoy, at that point I'd say, well, hey, you know, if you're going to have it this year or next year, you might as well do it now. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that a little bit here in the first paragraph or two on the worksheet is that, you know, for those of you who are trying to prolong the need for surgery, doing everything you can is very important, you know, as opposed to the person who's just sitting around saying, well, when the pain reaches an eight or a nine, then I'll get surgery, you know. So yeah, potentially there's a downside. So, okay, good, good, good. So let's talk about um, the knee replacement. If you look at that first bullet point there, I don't have the whole sheet memorized, so I have my cheat sheet up here. So, <laughs> um, so 
what is a total knee replacement? You guys probably already know most of this, but it's the surgical procedure. They're going to replace the weight-bearing surfaces of your knee joint. So that first couple um, spaces there are weight-bearing surfaces. And the purpose of that, of course, is to relieve pain and disability. So if you look at the knee, forgive my artwork before I even start, okay? Dad, you want to draw for me? I could. I was going to go. Do you want me to go? I was find just kidding. Oh, okay. Uh, well, shoot, I was already out. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, I was gonna, I, I was gonna go find you our uh, knee model. Oh, sure. In case you thought that would be useful. Okay. So let's say this is your knee joint here. This is your femur coming down. So your thigh bone, your tibia coming up. This is what a knee would look like if you had nice cartilage on the ends of your knees. And you, know, everyone here had an X-ray before. The doctor or surgeon show you the x-ray. Mm -hmm. Did anybody have a nice space like that anymore? Mm -hmm. No. It's gone, right? Mm -hmm. So that space on an x-ray represents your cartilage, which covers the ends of your bones. When that's gotten all the way damaged and that space goes away, that's when they replace the surfaces of the knee joint. And I don't know how many of you have been brave enough to go on YouTube and watch the surgery, but there's a nice little like graphic, it's like a two and a half minute graphic where they, they don't show like a real knee, there's no blood or gore or anything, but it just kind of shows you how they shave off the bone. So they end up like shaving the bone, they just kind of take it off, and then that's where they put your implants. So it's metal implants, and then you have a plastic spacer in the middle. The other thing they do of course is they, they resurface your kneecap. So your kneecap would be sitting right in front of your knee, about like that. And so what they do with the kneecap is they flip it over and they put a little plastic button on there. And there's your total knee. So so what do they do with the kneecap? The kneecap, they just, on the undersurface of the kneecap, yeah. they just flip it over and they shave it down a little bit and they put a little plastic button on there. It's about that big. Like Teflon or something? No, it's more of just um, like a hard plastic. Yeah. You get like, oh, I didn't sign up for that. Do we need questions at the end? Because I have a Go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead, Linda. Um, some of my friends that have had knee replacement don't have a kneecap. Really? So, uh -huh. huh. You mean that would be a more traumatic they lost their experience. Kneecap before the surgery. Yeah, they would have I lost it before. I don't know. That. I just know that Yeah, that would have been one of my friends, anyway, said that she didn't have a kneecap. Once in a while, we'll run across someone without a kneecap, but that's because of something real traumatic that happened oh, okay. before okay. surgery. So, so they need a kneecap. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So structurally, your kneecap is actually, if you look at your quad muscles here, um, four muscles, it's your biggest group of muscles on your body. The quad muscles actually come together, and as they start to form a tendon, they actually engulf your kneecap, and then they continue on as a tendon right to the front of your, your shin bone, your tibia there. So to get the quad out, or to get the patella, your kneecap, out of there is a yeah, big that's deal. Traumatic. Yeah, very traumatic. Go ahead, Mary. Um, what is the purpose of the, the little... Um, the little button? The little button. You have arthritis on that side of your knee as well. So underneath... You're tracking has anyone heard of, like, <laughs> patellofemoral arthritis? Yeah. So basically, when you look at your x-ray, what they'll tell you is they break the knee kind of in half down the middle on an x-ray. They say you have an inside compartment over here and an outside compartment and they'll comment on the condition of your cartilage in both of those and they use words like mild, moderate, or severe just to kind of break it down and quantify it. So that's what they'll tell you, your level of arthritis, which is the level that the cartilage is gone. You also have cartilage underneath your kneecap and as that kneecap slides up and down and it's in the groove that it sits in, you get arthritis there as well. So they just, all the joint surfaces are cleaned up and covered. Yeah, go ahead, Kirsten. So the patellar uh, uh, groove is hmm. aligned with the prosthesis center. Yeah, everything's aligned up. Yeah. So on the prostheses themselves, so if you looked at the end of a femur, it's basically like two big circular, like round surfaces, like two big balls basically stuck together. And in the middle between there is a groove. And that's where your kneecap moves up and down in the groove. So the prosthesis, just like your femur had, has the same anatomy. The same groove and everything. Yeah. Good. Okay, so if you want to look at the next uh, blank there, most commonly performed on people with advanced osteoarthritis, arthritis, osteoarthritis, they're basically the same thing. 
Um, osteo just refers to bone, bone arthritis. People in my family are lucky enough we have rheumatoid arthritis, which is different. Oh, yeah. Hey, we do okay though. But so different types of arthritis, but osteoarthritis is what you would tend to think of as your regular arthritis, wear and tear of the cartilage. Making sense so far? Okay. And then on C there, it can be the total knees can be uh, performed as a partial or a total. You don't see partials quite as commonly as a total. Basically, with a partial, that would be typically for someone who is younger, like in their, say, 40s or 50s, and they only have really severe arthritis on one side of the knee and not the other. So we don't see it very commonly. Not much, right? I think I've seen one last year. Yeah, I'm at, I've had a couple of people, and again, if you only have arthritis on one side of your knee and you're still fairly young in terms of total knee replacements, it's a good idea to do a partial because then it's a different surgery than the total, and so then it prolongs the life of the next surgery. The average total knee replacement, they say, will last you about 15 years or so, although that number seems to keep growing over the last few years. Might be able to push it for 20. So partial or total. And like we mentioned earlier, you're only going to be considering this, hopefully, um, like you said, Margie, when all of your, so that blank is conservative, when all of your conservative treatments have been exhausted. So a lot of people, have people already had like um, arthroscopic surgery on their knees? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Torn meniscuses. Yeah. Clean this up. Clean that up. Okay. <laughs> it's funny when it's not you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting to watch when they let you. Yeah. They are interesting. Once like you're on the moon, when you look at those cameras and the. And the, the first bones. one they let me watch, the other two they didn't. Yeah. And I think most of you already can agree with that. I mean, when you've exhausted all of your options, you've done what you can with physical therapy, most of you have probably tried injections, a lesser surgery, um, anything like that, then you start to get to the point where you say, okay, this might be, a, this might be right for me. So, Lou. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, exhausted everything on me. I'll be 46 tomorrow, and he really didn't want to do a total knee on me. Yeah. But it's, it's the lap, end of the road, so. And we get patients like that, and unfortunately, you can probably agree when you get to your level, it's like, well, what's the alternative? Yeah. Just suffer for the next exactly. 40 years? That's what I asked him. Yeah. yeah. So. And we get patients like that. Actually, my older brother had a total hip when he was 32. Yeah. And, um, but again, they don't want to do a total hip until you're at least 60. Yeah. They last a little longer than knees, but even so. But again, all of his cartilage was gone. Yeah. What are you going to do? You know? And you can do, did you do those um, Synvisc injections too, yeah. Scott? Yeah, I didn't do nothing. How much? Anybody else do those ones? Mm -hmm. The Synvisc? Some people get like six months to a year out of them. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the first one was great. Yeah. It never worked after that. It didn't? Really? Yeah. They don't. Well, you just have one March. I had one in March. Mm -hmm. And some people have some good relief with them. And again, if they get you another year or two until that surgery, might as well. And my biggest thing when you're looking at surgery is, <clears throat> are you are you living the life that you feel like living? You know, I think you could probably agree with that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, are you doing the activities you want to do? Because at some point, you know, your quality of life comes into play. You say, well, I'm doing okay, but I can't ride my bike. I can't play with my grandkids. I can't do this. I can't do that. And it's different for every one of us, of and course. It, it kind of gradually yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. narrows down. Exactly. So when you get to that point where you say, hey, this is starting to really impact my my life, then it's like, okay, well, let's make let's make the tough decision if you need to. And if you, at that point, if you haven't exhausted all of your conservative options, then, then do so. You know? So. All right. Who is Luke Gordon? Probably could just skip this one. That's me. So I'm Luke Gordon. Um, and I kind of already introduced you to why we're talking about total knee rehab because, again, a lot of times we see folks afterwards that could have done better with us if they had had a little more information earlier on. That's why I created that report. <coughs> Did anyone here already get the free report on the eight, the eight things you can do before total knee replacement <coughs> surgery? From the newspaper? What was that? Yeah, the yeah. free report that I put together. Oh, they did. Okay. Anybody want it that didn't get it? The sheet that was with the newspaper? No, let me show it to you real quick. Okay. Hold on, I'll grab it. I've got a stack back here. You're not talking about this from the newspaper? Nope, I've got okay. more information than that. Um, I don't know the lady's last name. My friend's sister is retired. Oh. You didn't get that one, Denise. 
Thank you. Oh, yeah. All right. Who else would like a copy here? There you go, madam. There you go. Marjorie, you mentioned the pink sheet. You got the pink sheet in the mail in the newspaper. Huh? Yeah. The funny thing with running an insert in the newspaper is I, I never know if it actually goes out. It did. It was really interesting because I'd just been talking to my sister on Monday about, you know, I'm stalling, I'm, you know, and here comes this sheet. It was sort of like the universe saying, you want to make a decision? Good. Color. Good. Go get some more information and then make your decision. Anybody else? You got one? Okay. All right. So that's why I created the report. And one of the reasons that someone was asking me, Judy, you're asking me how many therapists we have. We have five therapists here. Um, by full time, we have another part time therapist too. But one of the reasons that we, we do specialize in Tony rehab is I think for a lot of people, when they go to rehab, and by rehab, I mean like outpatient, like this, not inpatient rehab, um, it's very, total needs aren't that confusing from a therapist's perspective. We know exactly what you had done, there's no guesswork. We don't have to figure out what structures are involved, we just know. And to some extent, I think that puts you in a false sense of security as a therapist. And it's very common for people just to get passed off and say, well, hey, Judy, go do those 10 exercises over there and go ahead and go. And um, that's not how we do it, first of all, here at the clinic. But really, I think a lot can get overlooked, even from a total new perspective. And you can say, well, Judy's needs may be different than Les's needs for, for rehab. You know, Judy may have more issues with muscular soreness, or they leave the ligaments on the inside and outside of your knee. You may have a ligament issue, too. And if you're just kind of run through the puppy mill type clinic, no one really is ever going to catch that. And so, you know, there's definitely benefits to doing things like hands-on therapy to relieve some of that pain and hands-on therapy to really move you and stretch you. And there's a lot of benefits from different types of taping, like kinesio taping. And so, again, I think it's very easy for us therapists to just kind of overlook any of that and just say, well, hey, Judy, go ride the bike, go do your stretches, go do your leg raises, go do this, we'll set you up on ice, you're good to go. And I mean, that, people do well with that too. But, so that's one of the reasons why we talk about it, why we specialize in it, is because there's a lot more you can do just to recover faster. So not to put any other, anybody else down, but that's kind of how we approach it. Go ahead, Kirsten. What if all four of the ligaments are either damaged or missing? Um, well, your ace, so the four ligaments, like you mentioned, you've got one on the inside, one on the outside. They'll leave those. The two on the inside are going to be gone anyway, so okay. don't worry about those, your ACL and PCL. Yeah. So are those torn on you? I don't have an ACL anymore. Yeah. And so. the lateral ligament is, is stretched out. Yeah. And just flopping around. Yeah. So they're going to take your two inside ones anyways and get okay. rid of them. They actually, the way they build the prostheses is that they have little types of like ridges that kind of mimic the function of those ligaments. So the knee is very solid. Um, and then like, like you're mentioning, if you have pain on the inside ligament or the outside ligament or instability <coughs> like you might have, then we definitely want to be aware of that and treat you a little differently. And you know, so different types of therapy, different types of taping would help with that. Well, in the surgery, do they put a, a new ligament on the sides or not? Or no. So you, you go around with a loose rubber band? Um, yeah, but I mean, those things can tighten up over time as well. And the one thing they'll do is they'll make your knee pretty snug during the surgery. The way they do that too is they have the, so the two components that go up to the femur and down to the tibia, those prostheses are both metal. Between the metal is a big plastic spacer. So depending on your knee and how lax it is, they can adjust the height of that spacer. So they might just take up some of that slack for you. Oh, okay. So your LCL will be <coughs> maybe a little more tight and your MCL will probably be painful because they're stretching it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but again, so that's why we do some specialty work with total knee replacements and um, one more thing in background. I've been here for 10 years, a little over 10 years. No one threw me a party. Sure. I don't get it. You know, I throw people parties. No. We move on. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Time for a new job, right? Yeah. <laughs> My dad and I own the clinic, so we're kind of a family, family atmosphere, so. I do have a question. Go ahead, Marilyn. Uh, do you find that the, uh, the surgeons in this area, do they vary in their what they do very much? That's a good question. And I just talked to some guy on the phone the other day. He said, well, are there different types of prostheses, different that? And for the most part, the surgery is very straightforward. The prostheses are very standard. The way that they cut and, you know, kind of chisel off the sides of the bone is very standard. They have little guides that guide the, the different blades and things like that. So there's not a huge variability there. 
And what I would say though, there's newer technology coming out with some of the surgeons where they actually will do imaging. That was you, Janice, right? Um, where they'll actually do imaging on your knee and build the prosthesis specific to your structure. That's newer. Who's well, your surgeon, that Janice? Would be, um, Dr. Lynch at Northwest Orthopedic. That's right, Dr. Lynch. So that's newer. The other thing um, that's newer is that there are some surgeons up north that will treat it more like a day surgery, especially if you're in really good condition, and they won't even have you go to the hospital. So they'll treat you like a day surgery, and you'll just go to their outpatient surgical center, and you won't ever go to the hospital. You just go home. Northwest Orthopedic is starting that. Are they doing that? But it uh, depends on each individual. Definitely. Your BMI, um, I think, is what it depends on. Yeah, and I think it's just more like your general mobility. And, mm -hmm. I mean, because if you are going to need the extra help, going to the hospital makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. for a day. Plus pain relief. Really. Exactly. So for two, you know, the average person after a toning was had like two days in the hospital. So it's not a long time, and it's a nice spot to just kind of recuperate and rest. But for those folks that are really you can't first, rest in a hospital. no resting, yeah. <laughs> Come on, yeah. Luke. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, right? Yeah. But for someone who is really active and they don't want to go to the hospital for whatever reason, I mean, it's a nice, it's a nice option to have. And the surgeon will tell you if you're a good candidate for that or not. Sorry, I've, I've heard about cartilage implantation. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more? Well, varied levels of success is what I would tell you. I mean, I would talk to, there's a couple surgeons. Have you talked to any specific surgeons in no, town that do it? I look things up. I know Dr. Mitchell does some of that. He's a really good surgeon to go to. He's over at Providence, Brian Mitchell. So there are different ways they can stimulate cartilage growth or they can implant it. Um, the best thing I can tell you there is to talk to a surgeon that does it to see if you're a good candidate. Most folks who are ready for a total knee aren't a good candidate for that. Because usually if you have uh, a lot of healthy cartilage, but like a big chunk of it has been removed for some reason, so typically see that in like younger athletic type people. But again, if you have areas of really healthy cartilage and then you just have like a chunk that got somehow knocked off like during a fall or something like that, those are, those are an option. Where do yeah. they get it? What's that? Where do they get it? The cartilage. Usually it's, um, they mix it, they mix like a, um, a serum fluid. They take part of your cartilage and they mix it and they make like a paste and then they implant it on there. The other thing you'll see too is they'll do like kind of like a microfracture surgery where they'll punch holes in your cartilage to stimulate growth. Mm. But you have to have some. Yeah. yeah so they, they can't use um, stem cell or anything like that. Don't I'm not sure if they use stem cells yet for that. I asked Last about I heard it was a stem serum. Cell. It was more I, of I your own native serum. About stem cell. I was told that if you're Kobe Bryant and you have a little damage to one healthy knee, it might work for you, yeah. but when there's nothing there <laughs> yeah. to, to uh, trigger, then it's just a waste of money, yeah. and it's expensive, yeah. six to ten thousand dollars a treatment. If you're Kobe Bryant, go for it, huh? Yeah, <laughs> maybe, yeah. and you can afford it if you're Kobe Bryant. Exactly. Who care? They probably give it to you for free if you tell them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you still have some healthy level of cartilage, I would definitely at least talk to a surgeon. My favorite in town for stuff like that is Dr. Mitchell at Providence. And he doesn't do total knee replacements, so he'll tell you if you need one, he'll tell you to go to one of his associates. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Everyone ready to move on to part three? Mm -hmm. Okay, just keep shouting out the questions. This is good so far. So how do you know if you need it? We've already covered a lot of this. Um, severe pain that limits your everyday activities. Anybody wanna throw out any specific activities they're having a hard time with right now? Walking. Climbing stairs. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> stairs. <laughs> or going down. Don't we all oh, have branches? Or yeah. branches worse. Yeah. Up or down. Yeah, that's hard. Especially going down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very common. Try going down when you're on a cruise ship. And they, when you first get on, they, they, you know, have to do the thing where they, you have to get your life jackets on and all that good stuff. Yeah. I almost got ran over. I could only do one. One step, step at a time. <laughs> That's like when a your quality of life is being impacted, right? <laughs> when you can no longer go downstairs on a cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> right. Be warned. Yeah. That's right. That's good. Yeah, that makes sense, though. Yeah. 
Any other specific activities? I know Les, you're biking. into bike riding. Skiing. Skiing, yeah. Biking, skiing, yep. Kayaking. Yeah. Oh, wait. Windsurfing. Yeah, I'm trying to get in and out. Really, Kirsten? Oh, mm -hmm. Nice. But if you can get in, you're okay, yeah. Les, are you going to well, ski and bike again after yeah, your surgery? Kind of, but you know what's I'm sorry? <laughs> are you going to ski and bike again after your surgery? Of course. Awesome. That's one thing I've heard. I've heard conflicting reports from doctors. Some say you can, some say you can't, some say you have to stick to the easy stuff. Yep. And depends on your doctor and depends on if you listen to your doctor. I get the feeling that Les is just going to do whatever he feels like. <laughs> I wonder why. Oh, what was that? So I get the feeling Les is just going to do what he feels like. Um, but no, so that, you're absolutely right. Depends on your doctor. I think when you look at your total knee, longevity wise, and I'm going to pick on you, Scott, when you're only, what did you say, 40, Six. 46, you might want to take it a little easier on your knee. That's what my doc said. Yeah, you might want to push it and try to get 20 years out of it. Yeah. Um, so it just depends on your long-term outlook. And then for some people, they're not willing to not ski. So it's like, okay, well, do your best. You know, it's probably smarter to stay on more like groomed runs and not go in the trees as much. But it's kind of a personal decision. Biking's good though. Kayaking. Who was the kayaker? All right. Did you get out this year yet? No, I'm having too much trouble this oh, yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But my kids <clears throat> every day practically. Yeah. The weather's so good. How about playing with the grandkids? Anybody play with the grandkids? Like to wrestle? Anything like that? They're older. bigger than I am. <laughs> it's no fair anymore. You mean like get down on getting the down floor? Down. Getting down on the floor. Yes. Down is fine. Getting down, down. Yeah, on the floor. You, yeah. you might get down. Yeah. Have not help you getting up. Yeah. Can you That's kneel it. after a knee replacement? You know, you can at some point. It just feels really weird. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good now. Usually about after a, a year or so is when most people can start to kneel on it a little bit. You know, it probably feels better like a like a little um, squishy pad. Do we have any gardeners yes. in the group? Have you seen those little those little benches they have mm -hmm. where you can sit on it and if you flip it over there's a nice layer of foam underneath it so you can kneel on it. So you might use stuff like that if you want to kneel. Or you kneel on your other knee. What's that? Or change religion. There you go. There you go. Um, raised beds. That's, that's the way to go. Yeah. Any dancers in the audience? I train dogs. dogs. Yeah, train dogs, that's mm -hmm. good. Dancing? Oh, Dancing yeah, well, can you like. do things like polka and the fast German waltzes and all those things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so again, we already kind of mentioned this earlier, but this is the type of information you're gonna use to just decide if you're ready for a Tony replacement. You know, you say, well, gosh, I would love to do this, this, and this, and I'm starting to not be able to do any of it, okay? Have I exhausted all of my conservative options? Have I done everything I can? And you know, take all those factors into consideration. How old am I? How much do I want to get out of this knee? So, everybody good there? Good, good. So the biggest thing then, if you look at um, 3B there, and this is again, how you're gonna know if you need a total knee, is that blank is resting. So moderate, severe pain when you're resting day and night. For those of you who have had knee pain previous to this, which is probably everybody, um, before you have like really bad arthritis, a lot of times what should happen is that if you rest, your knee pain tends to go away. Maybe not 100%. And Scott, yeah, so when it doesn't go away anymore, that usually means you're getting closer and closer to that end stage arthritis. Um, the next one there goes hand in hand with that. You get long lasting inflammation and that blank is swelling. And it doesn't get better with rest or medication. Are there conditions besides end-stage arthritis that will give you consistent levels of pain? Sure, definitely. All sorts of ligament injuries, meniscus injuries. But again, typically those ones aren't going to bother you so much when you rest. And if you rest in ice and do like anti-inflammatories, typically those tend to improve. When you get end-stage arthritis, even if you do a lot of that, you, you really can't make much of a dent in the pain usually. So, so when rice doesn't help, then it's time. Basically, yeah. You know your acronyms. Does everyone know RICE? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Would you go over it, please? Yeah. RICE. So we got rest, 
ice compression and elevation. Combine that with like an anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen or Aleve. I mean, if you're doing all of those things and you're still not making a dent in the swelling and the pain and your knee is hot and angry and you're not really doing much, you're probably ready. That's not you, is it? <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not uh, yet. Several days a week. And then it suddenly goes away. It comes on suddenly and suddenly goes away. Yeah. And nothing helps. Even position doesn't help. Yeah. Scotch. Scotch. There we go. <laughs> Throw up with that. You want something else? Wine? Red wine? The problem with red wine is you have to drink more. Scotch might be better. Less sugar. Yeah. All right. Um, D there, that blank is bowing. So a bowing in or out of your leg. Les, do you have a little bit of that on your knee? Is it, it bowing a bit? It, uh, I, I'm bo I, it, the line is straight. It goes off about three degrees. Yeah, that's what I thought when I said Part of the joint in. is gone, and part of it, the other inside of it is still okay. Yep. So your knee will bow in yep. or yeah. out. Yeah. Yep. I don't mind bows or not. Yeah. The reason it bows is again, if you drew that line down the middle of your knee, you have an inside compartment and an outside compartment. And if one compartment really is more arthritic than the other, your knee will just shift towards the more arthritic one. So less when your leg kind of shifts out, so like that, that outside compartment for you is probably completely trashed. And that, the, in, the inside the one might be show. a little better. That's what the x-ray shows. Yeah. And sometimes your x-ray might actually be that both of them are all bone on bone, but your, your outside one may have just gone first and then it started to drift over that way. There's still cartridge on the inside. Is there? Yeah. Are you a candidate for a partial? Or do they just say go straight for a total? They said go, for, go straight for the total. Yeah. So that's what happens there. And then that last uh, bullet point there, 3E, e, um, knee stiffness. What was that? I couldn't. Uh, stiffness is oh. that blank. Who's got a stiff knee? Lots of people. Anybody want to show off? How much can you get, Linda? Um, after I've been up and walking for an hour, I can get about. OK. Can everyone see Linda? She's about there. But about, I can't get any farther. About 90. Yeah. 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 This one I can get Thank a little you. bit more. I want to feel like a star today. It's a good presentation. <laughs> Are both your knees having trouble? Yeah. Mine? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else got a tight knee? How far can you get it, Mary Lynn? Oh, I don't know. Not very far. About 90. Yeah. 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 And chances are when you try to pull it farther, it just doesn't want it's to go. Too, it's yeah. It just hurts. You can't do can't do that anymore, right? I <laughs> cannot do that anymore. Yeah. That is oh. true. My arthritis yeah. is pretty good. So I don't think I ever was able to do that. <laughs> 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 I was born stiffer than How much angle could, will, do you, are you able to get after your knee replacement? Good question. I was just gonna ask I was just gonna ask you guys that. Does anybody know how much would they hope to get after surgery? At least ninety oh, degrees. Robert knows. <laughs> no, you're good, Linda. <laughs> At least how many? What was the question? At least ninety degrees. At least ninety. So 90 would get you about there, right? Uh -huh. um, typically where we end up with people in the clinic is about 135. Oh, wow. About 135. Typically in the back, you know, maybe five or 10 years ago, they said, well, 120 is all you need. For functional, yeah. Yeah, and back then I think even some of the surgeons were fine. If you got to 120, that was okay. 120 theoretically allows you to do everything you, you would want to do. Go up and down stairs, get out of a low chair, get up and down from the ground. The only thing you couldn't do with 120 is you couldn't like fully crouch. Typically though, your prostheses will go to about 135 or 140 maximally. And so we'll try to push people at least to 130 and about 135 is kind of that sweet spot. It's funny too, because if you look at how you walk, when you walk, your knee doesn't bend more than say 30 or 40 degrees when you walk. But when your knee is limited to 90 degrees, it feels really stiff when you walk even though you only need 30. So when you start to break into like 100 degrees, 110, 120, everything frees itself up when you walk too and you feel like you can walk more smoothly and more freely. Yeah. Um, since we're on the, you know, the question of how much motion should you get, 
what's typically more important to us from a therapy standpoint is that you get it to fully straight. You want to get as close to zero as possible. Most folks get to around, somewhere around five. <clears throat> and if we can get you to zero, we do. That's where the old adage you about it's hard to straighten your knee after true. surgery. It is. It's hard to straighten your knee after surgery. Yeah. Oh, well, fine. Yeah. Is that because of the oh. swelling or just the implant? You know, it's oh. just really painful. The swelling more directly uh, impacts your ability to bend your knee. Because as you bend, that pressure, well, that swelling just builds and builds and builds. And when you straighten your knee, what you tend to get is you get a lot of pain along the back of your knee. So for whatever reason, those structures behind your knee are very irritated after surgery. And when we get to the point where we're kind of transitioning into aggressive stretching, which we try to do as early as possible just to get you flexible quickly, people can tolerate a pretty good forceful push into their knee bend. And when it comes to straightening their knee, they can barely tolerate five or 10 pounds of pressure. So the, th the reason you want your knee straight though when you walk is that typically when you walk, your knee will go straight as you extend your foot out in front of you. And so if your knee doesn't go straight, it really throws off your walking pattern. I didn't ask this question, can of worms. Chances are at least half of you have hip pain or low back pain as well, I would, I would wager. And so if you walk around on one stiff leg and one fairly regular flexible leg, it throws off all of your mechanics, then your hips and low back start to really talk to you. Yeah, any other questions on that motion? Uh, yeah, if you can bend at 135 degrees, is that enough to do a leg back bench press? <coughs> oh yeah, 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 definitely. You're ready, huh? Is that something you should do after? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, most of the things that you should do after um, knee surgery just depends on when you do it, just the timing. You want to make sure you have your priorities straight. And the priorities for us is you need to get your flexibility back as quickly as possible. Do everything you can do, stretch the daylights out of that knee, get it back as quickly as possible, because the longer and longer you get from your surgical date, the harder and harder it will be to, for you to gain full flexibility in your knee. And we're gonna get down to that, I think, in just a little while. On five there, we're gonna talk about stiff knee syndrome. That's what you really want to avoid. You don't wanna get stuck in that place where your knee is stiff, um, especially once you get to, say, two or three months post-surgery. If you have a stiff knee by then, you've got a really uphill battle to fight at that point. So, scare tactics, right? Jeez. Can you come back Keep from it light knee syndrome, though? Is it possible? Yeah. Yeah. And through yeah. just physical therapy? Or... <clears throat> Once in a while, people will do a manipulation. It's not super common anymore, really. <laughs> well, you're asleep, oh, so okay. it's good. <laughs> yeah. I've offered to do it in the clinic. I said, you know, I will bring a bottle of scotch or bourbon, and um, you get here an hour early. Party on, huh? We'll set up the bar, and then, yeah. No, so manipulation is something, again, you do want to avoid it if you can. Basically, if enough scar tissue builds up around your knee and you just can't bend it or straighten it, they'll go back in, they'll put you under, and they'll just tear the scar tissue. It sounds really gruesome, right? And before I saw it, personally, I was like, man, they must really have to, like, take that knee and just really, you know, ram it down. When you're asleep, they barely even have to push on you to get the scar tissue to tear. Mm -hmm. Same thing with shoulders when they manipulate a shoulder. Well, then you're going to start, actually, after they free that up, then you've got to start all your therapy over again. Well, then you come to us five days a week for yeah. about two or three weeks, and yeah. we just stretch and stretch and stretch, and you take your hydrocodone before you come. If you just have it done and go home and don't do anything, no. then it'll just go right back to where yeah. it was. The average person can avoid that, though. Once in a while, and this probably happens like once every three or four years, we get someone, for whatever reason, their body just really scars up heavily. You get those people that have, like, when they get a scar, they get, like, a keloid scar. Mm -hmm. You ever seen those where they're big yes. and they're yeah. puffy? Those folks tend to scar more, more than they need to for whatever reason. And if those people have a knee surgery or something like that, they tend to scar really quick. And you're pushing on them, you're pushing on them, you're pushing on them, and their range of motion actually starts to get worse, and it's really hot, and it's aggravated. Those are, and we can identify. Early identification is really important for those folks. to say, well, you're headed that direction. Let's do it now. If you wait too long, your surgeon won't do it, too. Had that happened before. So I blame the surgeon on that one, though, because I told him months before that she needed it. <laughs> so, anyways, okay. 
Good, good, good. Okay, for their, um, there are some risks and complications just to go over them real quick. Infection occurs in less than 1% of patients. So we don't see a lot of knee infections. Which is good, because that's a big deal when you have a knee infection. It's a really big deal. Because then your prosthesis has to come back out. It's no good. And then you're on IV antibiotics for a good probably six months or so. You've had a knee infection, right? Yeah. Then your food tastes funny. Yeah. Who knows what other damage you've done by coursing antibiotics through your body. Taking your probiotics. Yeah. Eat your, um, oh gosh, fermented cabbage, sauerkraut. Eat your sauerkraut or your yogurt. Um, uh, that B part is deep, deep vein thrombosis, which is basically a blood clot. So DVT, if you want to just do that for short, DVT. Up to 15% of patients will get a blood clot in their leg. Usually that's identified by tenderness in your calf. Um, not the end of the world if you do. You just typically have to identify it early again. Your therapist can usually tell you. And then you'll want to get on a blood thinner. Your doctor will put you on a blood thinner. They don't put you on prophylactically? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It makes more sense. You need a new one? Yeah. Nerve injuries aren't that common either. 1 to 2% for nerve injuries. D, persistent pain and stiffness. That's a, that's a wider range depending on what studies you look at. 8 to 23% of patients will have some kind of persistent stiffness in their knee. I got lost here. Where are you? I am on. Did you get four. Did you get 4B? Yes. That's 15%. Four, 4C is 1 to 2%. Okay. 4D is 8 to 23%. And 4E is about 2%. Okay, thank you. So yeah, a lot of these complications aren't that common. Um, 4D is what we tend to focus on because that's what we can help you avoid is, so five there is stiff knee syndrome. So stiff knee syndrome, just like it sounds, you've done your rehab, your PT, and your knee just didn't get all the way straight or didn't bend all the way, or sometimes both. So what we commonly see is someone with just kind of a, a <coughs> stiff leg, and when they walk, they can't quite straighten it, and when they walk, they can't bend it very well either. The thing you get with stiff knee syndrome too is that you tend to have pain with it as well. So it hurts. It can be inflamed, it can be red. And again, it's one of those things where we might get a string of patients who have it, you know, once in a while, and then we tend to think, well, geez, what could we have done differently beforehand? Um, so we'll get into that too. But so that's what it looks like. So basically, so 5A there is a permanent inability to bend or straighten the knee. <clears throat> Does anyone think they know the number one risk factor for getting stiff knee syndrome? Inactivity. Yeah. Exactly. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's what? Inactivity, immobility. So if you go home and say, gosh, this knee really hurts, I'm just going to hang out for a week or two, you're in trouble. <laughs> when does it set in, like uh, the patients that you see, when, when you recognize that it's starting to be stiff knee syndrome. Is it earlier or later? You can see it pretty early. And for some people, it kind of depends too. Everyone's pain tolerance is different. And most folks are taking a pain medication after knee surgery, which is a good idea, because you want to be able to really stretch your knee out. And I'm not a huge fan of narcotics, but it's temporary. You're not going to get hooked on them. It's temporary. When you take narcotics when you're in a lot of pain, people don't tend to get hooked to narcotics that way. You know, when you're taking them for chronic pain, yeah, you're in trouble there. So, but pretty early on, we can start to see the person's not there. You know, most of your success really is what you do at home and how well you follow your rehab um, program and really stretch. And for those folks that just don't stretch a lot because it, it hurts them too much or whatever, we can see it pretty, pretty early on. And then it just kind of gradually gets worse. Thank you. Yeah, and again, Identifying that quickly is really important. So top three things you do for trying to avoid it, keep moving, that first one. Lots of just general walking and stretching. So that kind of goes into keep moving. Try not to baby the knee too much. <clears throat> compression stockings help. I know no one wants to wear compression stockings, but they help control your, your swelling after surgery, so they do help you avoid it as well. What about a compression sleeve? The, yeah, exactly. Not a sleeve, a stocking. Right, but I mean, can you just use the black, those black? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, you want it to go. Sleeps. You want it to go at least that high. Preferably, you have it go even above the knee. Okay. okay but at least to at least to there to control the swelling in your lower leg. Oh, okay. Because it's really hard to get on. Yeah. I mean, it took me about so no one, 15 minutes. No one likes them, but they do help control your swelling. One of the so. one of the um, things that sell, like I think Dream Dream products or something, like that, they have the compression that you have a zipper, you know, on the oh. inside. Wow, that I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, yeah, they're a pain, but again, yeah. it, it's temporary, you know. And if it if it increases your chances of having a better outcome, then How it's probably worth it. How long for the stocking? Usually, the first couple months. Yeah. So your knee will have swelling for about six months or so, but you know, hopefully, you'll be basically through the woods with all your rehab. Somewhere in that second to third month, you'll be done. Hopefully, you'll have your motion. Your strength won't be 100%, but it'll be coming steadily so you can just continue on your own. And, But again, your knee will still have some level of swelling for about six months or so. You think, gosh, my knee, and actually it looks like your knee is bigger. Like it looks like it's structurally bigger. People say, are those implants bigger? It's like they're not actually. It's just a level of swelling that's well, it makes me taller. Yeah, potentially. <laughs> yeah. Ask, I want one. ask for a lift. <laughs> I want one. You have to go to the doctor that makes it <laughs> according to I want to be what taller. you want. That's right. If I'm going through all of this, I want to be taller. Want. That's right. It's easier just to wear heels. <laughs> oh, no. no, no, no. That works better for you? Yeah. yeah. Better for me, yeah, at six foot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that last, um, that last blank there with the checkbox is prehab. Is what? Prehab. Prehabilitation, prehab for short. And that's also number six is prehab. Has anyone already heard me talk about prehab mm -mm. in the newspaper article or anything like that? I read the, the article. <clears throat> so prehab, if you look at the, the blanks there, prehab is the one thing that you can do before surgery that can improve your chances of quicker recovery by 29%. So they actually did a study on this in 2014, and people who did prehab actually had 29% on average, faster recovery, less medical expenses. And if you think about it, these are folks that were engaging in specific exercises and stretches leading up to their surgery, putting their knee in the best position, and then doing their rehab. So it makes a lot of sense that they would tend to do better on average mm -hmm. than the person who waited as long as they could, the pain was so severe they weren't doing anything, they're sitting around, their knee is super stiff, the muscles are very weak, and then they go in for surgery. Okay, they're gonna have a harder time. So you're doing muscle memory training. You're doing all sorts of strength and flexibility. Yeah. 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 So that's kind of in the next bullets there. So if you look at six A, your knee, that blank is range of motion. So your range of motion, that's a fancy word for flexibility. So when you do pre-op, we check your motion to minimize the chance you're gonna develop the stiff knee syndrome. Part B, then, is we're also looking at your muscle strength. Those are the two biggest things that you can do before surgery. So again, Linda, your knee is pretty stiff. Are there some stretches that we could show you that you could tolerate before surgery? Definitely. You know, Can you do something that's really going to aggravate your knee and stretch it? No, that's not a good idea. You know, Can you do things to strengthen your quad muscles before surgery that won't aggravate your knee? Of course. Could you strengthen your hip muscles? Are there weaknesses in your core? So everyone's a little different in terms of what kind of prehab activities they would need to do, but people in general across the board benefit from doing it just because they go in with a better knee. You go in with a better knee, you come out with an easier recovery. And again, that kind of takes us kind of full circle with the, with the presentation today is that, you know, as outpatient therapists, we tend to like think these things when people are coming in, like, well, gosh, if someone had told you two months before your surgery that you could have a better outcome if you just did three or four exercises, that would have been nice. But we don't know you before your surgery typically, so. So there we go. All right, that last uh, point on 6C, um, we also talk about take home, that, bl that blank is take home instructions to follow after your surgery. <clears throat> you get a lot of instructions from your surgeon too. And then if you're on, if you have Medicare, you'll typically get a home health therapist and a home health like nursing staff, and that's pretty helpful too. So they'll keep you on track. Is that in addition to going to therapy? That's before you come to therapy. Yeah. So it depends. People who have private insurance or like Scott, yours is labor industry, right? Mm -hmm. 
they won't typically cover like in-home therapy where they'll come out and see you so you'll go probably straight to us like we'll probably see you three or four days after your surgery um, the person the average person with like a Medicare plan they'll have home therapy for like a week or two in their house before, so, you before they see us yeah oh, so they'll okay. have surgery, surgery. Yeah. yeah they'll have surgery they'll go home the therapist will come to their house and help them do their exercises stretches set up any home program they need. And then after a week or two of that, then they'll come see us. Yeah. So you get all sorts of instructions for what to do, what not to do. You can't drive yet. There are no buses. Yeah. <laughs> you usually so, need someone to drive you. So yep. if you end up spending two days in the mm -hmm. hospital, by the time you get out of the hospital, you're down here. Right? By day three? You certainly can be, yep. Three or they, four days. They make you walk the day of surgery. Oh yeah. Yeah. Move it or lose it. Yeah. yeah. And that's actually on seven. If you look at the most effective things you can do, um, there's actually quite a few things I could list there. Um, that first bullet, though, if we're following along, is walk. Just walk as much as you can. After surgery, typically you'll start with a walker, and then you'll get you know, you'll kind of transition to a cane. And then eventually that last that last blank is typically people are going to be independently walking by about two weeks. If you have other issues like with your hip or something, you might still be using a walking stick or a cane. But what we try to get about two weeks is you're able to do you're able to walk normally with equal stride lengths, so you're not limping around. If you're still limping around, you probably still need a cane or a walker. Not necessarily a race to get to that point, but it's kind of a good benchmark. So walking is very important. Um, that second bullet is strengthening exercises. And if people have time and want to go over that, I'm happy to show you some strengthening exercises. And that third bullet is stretching. So if you go down the list there, walking was the first one. Two weeks for normal gait. Do your strengthening and don't forget your stretching. Any volunteers want to help me demo some of these exercises real quick? Are people okay on time? Does anyone need mm -hmm. to fly out? Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone want to see the exercises? Yes. Sure. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Cool. I've always been thinking incorrectly, I believe, that um, because doing certain things hurts so much that I would make something worse, and I know that I need to prepare and get some strength back. Yeah. So I really do need to see these. and. Yeah. So you keep thinking about that, uh, whether it would harm, even though it hurts, am I harming myself more or not? So right. That's, yeah. I, I don't know where that line is, and I've kind of backed off, and boy, I'm just really out of shape. That's a good question. If, if you are already... I'm really out of shape because of yeah. thinking, and I'm not in a good place. I yeah. Think are you scheduled for surgery then, Denise? I'm not. I will probably have it, I live in Lewiston, I'll probably have it done in Pullman. Yeah. And I have several friends that have had good success there and several that have had good success with the Northwest Orthopedics up here. Yeah. But I don't think I'm going to come that far. There's oh, no, that, that's fine. In Pullman, so. no, I was just saying when you get to the point where you, um, you're planning on having the surgery stay within the next two months, I mean, you can start to push the envelope a little bit Okay. in terms of like, where's that fine line between like making it worse and making it better. Okay. And it's different for everyone, but just kind of start to push the envelope a little bit. Because when you've gotten to the point where you're going to have a knee replacement, you can't make the knee joint itself worse. You really can't. And even if you could, it doesn't really matter because you're going to have it. It's going to be okay. gone. You know? So, but, I mean, I definitely favor things that are more tolerable because what you don't want to get into is you're pushing it so hard that you're down for the rest of the day and can't do anything. Okay. So there's definitely a fine line. That's what I want you to consider when you're yeah. talking to us. Yeah. So let's skip to the third part with stretches first. Um, a couple of my favorite stretches, if you're on a staircase or a chair with arms preferably, to stretch your knee into a bend, one of the easiest things you can do is put your foot on that second step or on a chair with arms so you have something to balance on and just use your body weight to push your knee forward. Forward to the point of of your knee getting a really little tight. beyond <clears throat> cues. So right to the, I would say right to the uh, edge. Yeah. Okay. Right to the edge and then hold it oh, okay. for at least 30 seconds, okay. possibly even 60 seconds. Are we talking pre or post? <clears throat> pre. Okay, good. Pre-surgery, yeah. So you don't want your knee over your little toe, though? Um, you can on this one. Oh. Because you're not really, 
<clears throat> you're not really weight bearing that much. So you're basically stretching out the ligaments? Yeah, and the capsule. Yep, so you're stretching it into a bend that way. But look at what it does to your other knee that's rotten. <laughs> well, that knee's fine. Mine is. No, but I mean, two knees good. that are bad. Yeah. Same here. Well, and you've got, your, you've got your railings there, so there's not a ton of pressure on this back leg. Okay. You have most of your pressure on, on the front leg. <laughs> support. You want support. Margie, right. if you don't like that variety, what you could do instead is you could pull your knee back as far as you feel comfortable, and then you could scoot out a little bit in your chair and yeah, hold it that that's way. That's what I've been doing. And again, I would say push it to the point of pain mm -hmm. and try to hold it there for 30 to 60 seconds. And if it's too intense, then just back off a little bit. And then when you're ready, then just slide back. Oh, so you're doing it like off. this. Huh? Yeah, I'm pulling it back yeah. and then I, you use your body weight to slide forward to bend your knee farther. Is this to build up the muscles? Just flexibility. Oh, just, just flexibility. flexibility. Okay. Yeah, just to get the knee to bend. Going in with that mindset that again, the more flexibility you have prior to surgery, the easier it's going to be to regain it afterwards. <clears throat> I mentioned straightening your knee. A lot of folks going into total knee surgery can straighten their knee already, which is great. <clears throat> but if you can't, you definitely want to work on it. So again, second step, something you can hold on to for balance. Get the knee out in front of you and just lean forward and stretch back on your hamstrings. Yeah, hamstring runner stretch. And all of them hold for like 30 to 60 seconds? Yeah, definitely um, pre and post surgery. If you can get to a, like a moderate stretch, something that isn't super excruciating, but you can definitely feel it pulling. When you reach that sensation of pulling, if the longer you can hold that position, the better you are. That's preferable to really pushing the envelope into pain and only being able to hold for three or four seconds. Because what you want with stretching is you actually want to take that tissue and lengthen it and then leave it there. Mm. And with aggressive stretching, you're taking it out and letting it back in, taking it out and letting it back in. So think of like a rubber band. If you pull it like this and leave it there and you come back a couple minutes later and then you take the tension off, it's all loose. But if you just pull it and let it go back, pull it and let it go back, it never really stretches. So the more time you can spend at the very end range there is where you're gonna get the and most. how many rotations? How many reps? Each? I typically do like two or three at a time. The thing with stretching too is that if it's pretty comfortable, you can stretch three or four times a day if you're up for it. With a newer patient in the clinic for most of their stretches, I'll say, you know, try it once a day. If you feel pretty good, bump it to twice. You know, listen to your body, as it were. If your body's telling you it's too much too soon, then back off. Because we're all going to be a little different in that regards. John, that last exercise showed your foot be flexed or just relaxed? But it doesn't matter too much. I just relax it. Like oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Forward and stretch. Good. And then the most important thing for prior to surgery is getting your quad to to engage. So can everyone see how my quad is squeezing there? Mm -hmm. So we call that a quad set. Basically what you want to do for a quad set is you want your leg out straight in front of you. You can do it from a chair like this, or you can sit on a table or a bed and put your leg out straight. And you just want to be able to squeeze the quad. What happens after surgery is that the surgery is very traumatic for your quad muscle. Because they do your incision up the middle, they take that whole quad kneecap structure and they move it to the side so that they can access your bones. When they do that, they pull things like blood vessels and then after they're done with your surgery, like an hour and a half later, they put it back where it belongs. All of that pain and bleeding and swelling turns your quad muscle off. So pain turns it off, just inhibits it. So what you're trying to do then is before your surgery, develop a really strong connection between your brain and the muscle so you have really good control of it so that when you come out after surgery, you can reestablish that connection quickly. The connection isn't gone, it's just, it's just asleep. So you're tightening that? that yeah, just squeezing hand? it tight. And if you have a hard... So your hands don't have anything to do with it? No, I'm just showing you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so just tighten the muscle hard. And do you, do you hold it or do you do just the... I hold it for about five or ten seconds, yeah. So this actually isn't strengthening, it's just the fact of developing a really good, um, a really good relationship between your nervous system you know, and the control of the muscle itself. So you're just getting it to really fire. What about like a wall sit? 
Yeah, you could do a wall sit. Um, Does that do the same thing? Similar. Yeah. The other one, of course, and this depends on how your knee is feeling. You can do small squats. Do it. Uh -huh. Some people can, some people can't. Mm -hmm. The other thing I like to throw out too is if you have a really bad knee, if you have access to a pool, that's a great place to just stay active. Walk in the pool, walk forwards, walk backwards. You can get like a noodle between your legs and you can bicycle kick on the pool. You can do your stretches in the pool. If there's a staircase, you know, you can bend your knee, you can stretch your, um, stretch your hamstrings. If you can't do a squat on land, it's very likely you can go to the edge of the pool and do your squats in the pool. So anything you can do to keep those muscles strong. So squats are good if you can tolerate it. If you can only go down this far, then just go down that it's far. It's about 45 degrees. Huh? Yeah, just do what you can. I mean, if you still have enough comfort and you need to go down farther, go ahead. The thing you mentioned, you don't want your knee going in front of your foot. That's right, with a squat for sure. So um, when in doubt, you know, hold onto the countertop and push your butt way back. Okay, oh, actually, actually what you mean. Yeah, it's yeah, actually, yeah, it's much more comfortable for your knee too. Yeah, because if you squat forward like that mm -hmm. and your knee goes in front of your toes, it's really painful. So just exaggerate how far back your hips and your butt go. And if you're holding on to something here, you can even go even farther back. And so those are the most things I have to do for strengthening. Um, the other one that goes hand in hand with that quad squeeze is that if you're laying on your back and you can squeeze that quad nice and tight and straighten your knee out, you can do your leg lifts from your back. Even if you can't straighten your leg completely, that's still beneficial for you. Definitely, because you're still getting your quad and you're getting some of your hip muscles. The other one I really like for fo folks, especially if you have a hard time putting weight on that leg, is to lay on your side and do your side leg lift. And that's gonna work on this hip muscle here. Not directly, again, related to your, to your knee surgery, but if you've had knee pain for two or three or four years, chances are all of these muscles have gotten weak. The more strength you can get prior to surgery, the easier it's gonna be for you to transition away from your walker and away from your cane with a strong base of hip muscles. <coughs> So those side leg lifts can be either done lying down on your side or standing <coughs> up hanging onto a corner? Yep, standing up, they look like this. Yes, okay. Yep. I've already had a hip replacement. Oh and yeah. And I'll be having the knee then. Um, I haven't had any problem with the hip, it's done well. Yeah. But what did you just say about, uh, you know? The side leg? Yeah. You should be able to do that with your hip too, yeah. Yeah, hips are kind of a breeze compared to knees. Yeah. So I needed the knee done, yeah. but the hip went to heck. <laughs> I had to do the hip first. Right fast, they had to do that. Get the easy yeah. one out of the way. Yeah. Good. Any other specific questions on exercises or stretches? If you're on pain medication, how do you know how far to go with these exercises after? Prior to surgery or after? After. After surgery. Um, Go as far as you can, even with pain meds. It's not that you won't that know. Effective. You'll know. Oh, yeah. Okay. They yeah. won't take away your pain like you think they're going. No. To. <laughs> <laughs> they'll take the edge off. That's all they'll do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there any of those pain meds that don't give you severe constipation? Not that I know of. No. THC. Those are awful. Yeah. THC. Yeah. THC oil or THC oil. But, uh, yeah. The therapist that uh, I know said that there's a study out that. Uh, combination of Tylenol and ibuprofen is more effective than hydrocodone. That might be. Usually you want to check with your surgeon in terms of when they'll want you to do ibuprofen though. Because ibuprofen is going to slow your healing process down because it thins your blood out. Most surgeons at some point are totally fine with you doing ibuprofen, but a lot of times they'll have you wait at least a couple weeks. So just check with your surgeon before you start doing ibuprofen on your own. And yeah, again, the thing with pain medications is that it's a temporary thing, you know, so again, I don't like people being on pain meds in general, but there's a time and a place for them, and after surgery is definitely one of them, because you're in a lot of pain that you shouldn't be in. Yeah. But yeah, in terms of your after surgery recovery, you really have to kind of push your pain tolerance. And then you spend your day, you know, do some walking, do some stretching, ice and elevate. How soon can you drive? That's the way it is. Gosh, you know, it's Every usually... Every individual, but... Yeah, it's usually right around six to eight weeks. So, okay. Yeah. 
Rosars delivers groceries. Although, I would imagine, though, gosh, if it's your left knee, if it's your left knee. You have to be off narcotics. Some That's a gray say. area. Yeah. It's yeah. a gray area. Because so there's a lot of people on chronic pain yeah. medication that long haul truck drivers, you know. It's so, no wonder they're so scary. If it's on the left knee, I could do driving two weeks, depending on whether, the doctor will tell you, whether I've sure. taken a hydro mm -hmm. or not. More than likely, if you feel pretty good. And you know, everyone's a little different with pain medications. I mean, I've had pretty high dose pain medications and I've never felt drowsy. But I always kind of thought that was because I was taking them because I was in a ton of pain. Mm -hmm. So the pain was keeping me alert, I guess. I can never remember to take a pain pill <laughs> as soon as I'm not hurting at all. I mean, I don't understand people that just want to keep taking them. Well, at that it's point, it's more like a dependency. Yeah, it's a dependency yeah, issue. Yeah, and the thing I would tell you, too, when you're after a surgery is you want to take your pain meds as planned yeah. consistently, even if you're feeling pretty good. What will happen, especially with a major surgery, is if you skip a dose or two, the pain will get in front of you. Yeah. And then you're trying to catch it. So if you can stay ahead of the pain with your pain meds, that's where you want to stay. And then at some point, you can taper them down. But if you think, well, hey, it's day seven, I'm feeling pretty good right now, and then you wait, and then two hours later, you're like, oh, gosh, now I'm not Your mind has a way of tricking you. Yeah, then you're like, oh, geez, now you're trying to catch up, and it's yeah. an uphill battle there, What's too. the general rule of thumb I don't, on the pain meds? For how long course. to take? How long? Yeah. Like the uh, duration? But like two weeks or one or... You know, everyone's a little different. Probably, I would say, one to two months is typical. Oh, really? Yeah. So you can't think for all so that So you're time. tapering the dose oh, down, though. You're not taking the... Yeah, you might be taking a half dose at that time. Yeah. Or you might, and everyone's, so I've had people that get off them in two weeks, and that's fine, as long as your motion is where you want it to be. If you get off of it early and your knee motion is horrible, keep taking them. What's the point? Right? Yeah. But you still want us to take one before we come in to see you. It's always a good idea. Or share. <laughs> because we, yeah. we tried that both ways. With yeah, your shoulder, with your shoulder, yeah. You can tell the difference. Yeah, most of these post-surgical things are the one time when the old, you know, PT stands for pain and torture. This is like the only time that it's actually true. Because, yes. but again, that's, it's just a temporary period, and once you're through it, you're good to go. What well, insurances do you accept here? We accept pretty much all of them. The only ones we don't accept are, we're not in network with Kaiser Permanente, which is the new group health. Why aren't you in there? Yeah, you know, healthcare is fine. Why aren't you in their network? You know, we've been around for 30 years. At least. They just we apply every year. They only take a small group of people. Yeah, you That's kind of have to know. Yeah. Are they in, even in this area? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's clinics in the area. Yeah, there's one no, uh, yeah. And there's some other private clinics that take KP. We're still trying. We have an aquatic therapy program, so we're trying to use that as leverage to say, well, hey, there's not many folks that have aquatic therapy, and maybe your subscribers would like access to to that program. So we're so still trying. So would it help if we petitioned that? Sure. Can't if, hurt. That we talk to. Maybe by the time you have surgery, we will have it in network. Actually, you know, one of the therapists down the way, um, Russ, yeah. our friend, he was working with a person um, who she was talking to, and he said, yeah, I'm not in a member of group health at the time. And uh, she had some, I don't know who she was, but she had some pull. And so she said, should I talk to him? And he said, go ahead. Yeah. And I don't know who she was or what clock she had, but she talked to him and they called Russ and said, you're in. Yeah, give him a call. All right. So if you have a flag, where's your pool? It is, we actually rent the pool over at Evergreen Fountains. So due oh. east of here, real close to the Valley Mall area there. Yeah, it's a nice, not many of our total knees go in the pool. Once in a while, someone will um, because you you do tend to get more more bang for your buck if you will on land because most of what you need is for us to stretch you so, so now if you don't have uh, the where the health people come with so wait, how soon how soon can you have start <clears throat> physical therapy as soon as you're home oh really yeah yep like Janice was saying day three day four yeah you come in kind of looking a little bit greenish because that's just the pain meds are in you. And, so if you're from out of town, can you like double up or not? You know, are you coming from out of town, Judy? Diamond Lake area. Okay. You know, you probably don't need to double up. You just need to, if you're coming from out of town, you just need to really be good with what you're doing at home. Which again, you come in for like an hour long here, 
and if, I mean, if you're doing what you need to do at home, that's where you're going to get most of your mm -hmm. gains. And we'll just kind of walk you through it and mentor you and yeah. torture you a little bit. <laughs> just a little. Okay, Good. any last questions before I kind of summarize everything? How, uh, if you start right out of the gate coming here, how often do you see people during that immediate post operative period? Good question. During the first two to three weeks, we like to see you three times a week, just so we're very, you know, we're very focused on motion and flexibility. And then after that, we typically taper you down to twice a week. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Questions. Um. What about osteoporosis in older people? <clears throat> Will that thinning of the bone cause a prosthesis to fracture through if you're active or anything like that? Not typically. No, your osteoporosis doesn't tend to affect the femur and the tibia near as much as it does like the hips and the mid-back and some other of like the joints in your wrists. Yeah. So no, I've never run into any complications with osteoporosis. I don't have it yet, but I thought I'd ask. Don't go there, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's actually another, um, one of the downsides to not being real active before surgery is your bone density will suffer. When you're not active and you're not weight bearing and you're not walking and you're not jarring your bones, that's how your bones stay dense is by the activity, especially like load bearing activity. Um, so that's potentially a side effect of people with really bad knees. It's another side effect for people who have had like a fall because they don't get around as much as they used to. They're not as confident. So osteoporosis can definitely be one of those unintended side effects. Eat your veggies. The best advice. Can people with a knee replacement jog or <clears throat> use a treadmill or run? Yeah, most folks that we see don't really ever want to jog or run again. Um, but you can. It'll just it'll wear out your prosthesis a little bit faster. Yeah. But um, treadmill is usually good. Ellipticals are a nice way to challenge your cardio and your muscles too. Bike riding is a good way to do it. What about walking, walking hiking great. hills? Yeah, great. With a pack? Great. When you're ready, yeah. Yeah. I like where you guys are going. This is good. <laughs> cool. So let me just recap a little bit then. What I would say first off is that if you know you're going to have a total knee replacement, what we offer is, so we've talked about prehab and the benefits. Most folks that I've talked to don't want to come in for prehab, and it's very understandable. You're already planning on coming in after surgery. So what we do then is we do a free prehab visit with one of our PTs. So there's three of us PTs, my dad, myself, and Kaylin. Um, it's a free 30-minute appointment where we can look at you specifically and tell you, hey, you need to strengthen this, you need to work on this stretch or that stretch, and then go from there. Once in a while, I'll get patients who actually will come in and do prehab like through their insurance, that's an option too. But I think probably the best place to start, if you know you're having a knee replacement and you just want to do everything that you can to get a successful recovery, is just schedule a free appointment. So that's one option. Um, the other way you can take advantage of that is if you're still on the fence and you're not really sure if you need knee surgery, um, we can look at you there too and just say, well, hey, here's a couple things that are going on. Maybe you do have more pain associated with a muscle or a ligament or something like that that you could work with. So we do get a lot of patients that way too that come to us and say, well, I might need knee surgery, but I don't know yet. So we can tell you if we feel like we can help you avoid surgery. So that's an option too. Will insurance pay for a lot of the prehab? <clears throat> yeah, insurance will pay for it. Yeah. Okay. Most of your insurances require a referral from your doctor. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they'll cover it if you've got knee pain. Yeah. So that's an option. So I highly encourage anyone who's kind of looking at rehab, even if you don't plan on coming here after surgery, take advantage of it. We'll tell you what you need to know and get you going on a good path there. So that's one option. Um, again, if you are still on the fence and just want to have someone talk to you about it, then come on in and we'll take, take a look at you. Sound good? Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. So anyone who's interested in that, I'll stick around for a little while afterwards and talk to you. Or you can, you know, call us in the next week or so and we'll get you settled if you want to think about it. So if you have a lot of other joint issues, 
is the, um, you might say, rehabilitation from the knee, knee um, replacement longer or less efficient or what? Other joints like your other knees and hips and Back shoulders knees, and stuff? ankles, <laughs> <laughs> shoulder. It's not necessarily going to make your knee recovery longer. It just might make your recovery more difficult for your other joints. I see. I mean, as you're walking with a walker, if you've got sore shoulders, it's going to probably, you know, impact your shoulders a little bit. And the other thing that you see is if you're having, say, your right knee operated on, and your left knee and your left leg have been doing all the work, you know, sometimes that can be a factor too. You might just have more discomfort on that side because your right knee is now in recovery mode. So, but it won't slow down that knee necessarily, no. Okay, is a bilateral replacement never done? Yeah, once in a while. Not real common, but once in a while. It's kind of like the day surgeries. You have to be in pretty good shape to do it and you kind of have to talk your surgeon into it. <laughs> um, and what is it? Bilateral just means they do both at once, mm -hmm. both knees at once. We don't see a ton of it, but again, once in a while. Talk about being helpless. Yeah. <laughs> you thinking about it? You just the risk. Like, a, you know? I don't know, like a turtle that gets on its back. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to be tough. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, in, the, in the no, report. No, my sister-in-law uh, did. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> In the report, one of the tips is to make sure you talk with um, whoever's going to be helping you after surgery. And, and just be, yeah, and just be very upfront with what you need help with. You know. What does the literature say about the risk of having two knees done at the same time? Is that? That's a good question. I didn't read anything in recently Maybe there's on no two. My, my doctor research. said, well, with do one or two, and then you do two. It doubles the risk of infection and everything yeah. else. So he won't he won't do it. I doubt if they have enough people to really follow that kind of a study because it's just not that common. Yeah. And that's a good point too, Maryland. Yeah, your two incisions. Yeah. Length of <coughs> anesthesia. I mean, think of that. That's true. That's just that's a general anesthesia too. I I haven't had general anesthesia for my. It's I just had the uh, what do you call it? Spinal, yeah, and then uh, for just a, like a scope or something like that. No, for my for my hip, I, I he didn't use uh, a general anesthesia. Oh, okay, I just had a very what do they call it? A nerve conscious block. sedation and a yeah, nerve conscious block. sedation and then a nerve block. Yeah, which makes it recut when you wake up, it's a lot nicer. Yeah, you know, because it's they use <coughs> the same stuff as you know when you go in for other things too, mm -hmm. and it's you know you're not out. Yeah. Just you know, you're just unaware. So they try yeah. you? Yeah. Could you watch it then? Hmm? No. No, you, you you're know, out of it. I mean, have you ever had a colonoscopy? colonoscopy? Yeah. Well, Same that's way, what yeah. they give you, is an un the conscious, conscious sedation. sedation. You're not under, but you don't, you're able to respond. If they want you to move or do anything like that, you can do it. But then, you know, you don't remember anything. Yeah. I watched it on the screen. Did you? Well, then maybe you didn't have anything. I don't know. When I had a scope in my 20s, and I don't remember a thing, but it was the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's the beauty of Versed. Yeah. You were Versed. Versed. Yeah. Versed, yeah. Yeah. You can't remember yeah. what they did yeah. to you. Yeah. All right, you, you can't, last, have, uh, can't have that for everything, but you can have it for no, things exactly. in all the ways. So. Any last burning questions today? I want to say thank you. You're a very good communicator. Yes, yeah, you are. And uh, this Thanks. was a very helpful thing. Thanks, Denise. Well, thank you all for coming. If you have specific questions for me or Robert, we'll stick around here for a little while. And um, anyone who's ready to schedule like a pre-app consult, just make your way up front and we'll stick around for a little bit. All right. Thanks, thank guys. You, thank you. Thank you.